And if you have your Bibles, please turn to Luke chapter 23. Uh, if you've been with us the past few weeks, we've been uh, looking towards Easter. In this series, we looked first to uh, Palm Sunday, where Jesus came in as King and everyone shouted Hosanna. This past week, we talked about Jesus in the garden in agony, looking towards the cross. And today, we look at the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. I'd like to begin by reading from Luke chapter 23, beginning in about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And while the sun's light had failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come before you now. And we ask for help. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the crucifixion clearly. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the cross that was meant to kill is actually our victory. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. What is the cross to you? What do you think? I know in our culture, the cross can be sanitized in a lot of ways. We have it up behind us. We have it on necklaces. We have it on pictures. Everywhere you look, there's a cross. And in many ways, we forget about the horrific nature of the cross. We forget about the bloodshed that came with it and the torture of Jesus on the cross. I heard a story by N.T. Wright. He, uh, he's an Anglican archbishop, and he was told this story. He said there were uh, three young boys who came into a church one day, and the archbishop was sitting for the confessional. And the three young boys came in, and they were making a prank. And so the first one came in, and he listed all of these grievous sins, these outlandish sins that he had not committed, these things and ran out the door laughing and he did the same thing and by this time the archbishop had caught on and by the third boy who came in he came in he listed all of these grievous sins all of these things and he was chuckling to himself and the archbishop listened to him and he said um, son you've now repented of or you've now uh, confessed these sins now to show that you are truly repentant I want you to walk to the far side of the sanctuary to the picture of Jesus hanging on a cross and I want you to look into his eyes and I want you to say this three times. You did all this for me and I don't care that much. So the boy walked over and he said it the first two times. He said, you did all this for me and I don't care that much. And then he said he couldn't say it the third time. He couldn't say it the third time because he claimed that when he looked at Jesus on the cross, All the theoretics of Jesus did this and Jesus God's love reaching out and grasping hold of him, and he was changed forever. And so I ask you today, what is the cross to you? When you see the cross, does it put forth that emotion thinking, This is what Jesus has done for me? And then does your life reflect, Yes, God, it matters what you did? Or does it reflect, You know what? You did all this for me, and I don't care all that much. Today we're going to look at the cross. We're going to see five things that the cross teaches us or shows us. First, we see that the cross offers forgiveness. The cross offers forgiveness. Look at Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 32. It says, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with Him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals one on his left and Jesus said fight them for they know not what they do and they cast lots to divide his garments we see that the cross offers forgiveness before this Jesus had been on trial in front of Pilate 
And the mob had come and they had said, we don't want Barabbas, we want Jesus. And we want to crucify Jesus. And so what did they do? They led Jesus away and they beat Him. And they mocked Him. And they took a crown of thorns and shoved it onto His head. And the Roman soldiers there, they dressed Him in royal clothes and mocked Him and said, here's the King of the Jews. And they beat Him so badly that when it came time for Him to carry the cross to the skull, to the place where He was going to be crucified, He couldn't even carry it because He had been beaten so badly. In Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, it is the passage of the suffering servant where Isaiah, looking forward to this, talks about Jesus being the suffering servant on our behalf. And in Isaiah 52, it says this, His appearance was marred beyond human semblance. He was beaten so brutally that you couldn't even tell who He was. And so Jesus has endured all that, and then He goes and He's placed in between two criminals. Again, in Isaiah, He says this, And He was numbered with the transgressors, yet He bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Not intercession, not prayer for people who have done good. Not intercession and prayer to forgive His disciples whom He loved. But who is Jesus praying for? The very people who are beating Him and mocking Him and putting Him on the cross. Jesus cries out, Father, forgive them. Jesus offers forgive cross. Secondly, we see that the cross required suffering and shame. The cross required suffering and shame. Look at verse 35. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Verse 39, One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Jesus endured suffering and shame, and the cross required it. There are three different people ridiculing Jesus in this passage. First, you have the religious leaders. They come and it says that they scoffed at Him. The religious leaders came and they scoffed at Him. You're the Messiah! If you're the, the King, the Messiah, the Chosen One, then why are you still on the cross? Couldn't you get down? They scoffed at Him. And then you have the Roman soldiers. And in verse 36, it says they mocked Him and they came and offered Him sour wine and were ridiculing Him and they were casting lots for His clothing. And if you have this uh, step ladder, if you will, you had the religious leaders scoffing Him. You have the Roman soldiers mocking Him. And then you have the criminal hanging on the cross next to Him, insulting Him. Even the lowly criminal is saying, if you were the Messiah, save yourself and me as well. It doesn't get much worse than that when you have everyone there mocking you in the irony is that five times in these four verses Jesus is called the Messiah the chosen one and the king and five times they hurl these insults at Jesus saying if you were these things you'd be able to come down and the irony is he is those things on the cross the thing is on the cross he is not powerless but he was powerful and he did not come down off the cross because he was unable but He stayed on the cross to forgive sins and to make a way to God for us. Jesus could have heard all of those insults and He could have come right off the cross and decimated every single one of them. With a breath, He could have ended all of them, all of the mockery, all of the insults. But what did He do instead? He stayed on the cross for you and for me. Philippians chapter 2 is one of my favorite uh, passages in Scripture in Philippians 2, verse 8, Jesus being found in himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Can you imagine the humility it takes for God, 
who created everything and everyone, who created all of these people and in love made all things. And yet, in humility, He comes and He says, you know what? They should be worshiping Me. They should be crowning Me as King of all, as a good Father, and yet they are ridiculing Me and mocking Me. But you know what? I'm going to stay on the cross for them. I'm not going to come down. And I'm going to stay here because the cross required suffering and shame. He had to be a sacrifice in our place. He had to endure the wrath of God for us. And so the cross offers forgiveness and the cross required suffering and shame. Third, we see that the cross saves the worst of sinners. First sinners. Look at verse 40. Other rebuked him, the other criminal, saying, Do not do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. There's a contrast between these two criminals, isn't there? You have one criminal who's insulting Jesus, who doesn't believe who Jesus is, but you have another criminal who has this moment of clarity. He's hanging on the cross and he says, you know what? I deserve this. I deserve to be here for what I've done. But Jesus, he is, he's innocent. Likely, this man, this criminal, had heard of Jesus over the past three years and all the miracles that Jesus has done and everything that Jesus himself all next to him and he says Jesus remember me when you enter into your now likely this man didn't understand everything he was asking but he probably understood that Jesus was king over all he probably realized that Jesus was not bound by this death in this life and he says you know what there's another kingdom where Jesus is going to be reigning and I want to be a part of it it's amazing that Jesus offers him salvation, isn't it? A man hanging on the cross, either a thief or a murderer, done something vile and disgusting and wrong to be hanged on a cross, and yet Jesus looks at him and He offers him forgiveness and salvation. Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Think about this criminal and then think about the religious leaders of the day. They were God, weren't they? I'm going to say all the right things. I'm going to do all these sacrifices. I'm going to make my prayers. I'm going to do all these for God. And yet here, the vile criminal who has never done anything for God is accepted in salvation. And the religious leaders who are doing all these things are now going to face the wrath of God for rejecting Jesus. Jesus came for the lowly. Repeatedly in the Gospels, what is Jesus doing? He's going to the outcast, the downtrodden, those who are sinners, and He sees them and He doesn't say, okay, clean yourself up and then come to Me. He doesn't say, okay, get your life right and then come to Me, but Jesus is going to them. Robert Stein in his commentary, he said this, tax collectors, prostitutes, the poor, the outcast, and even criminals being executed for their crimes are able to find Jesus, all Savior. Jesus saves even the worst of sinners. It means that whatever you have done today is in the past. You are not defined by your past and what you have done, but if you are in Jesus, you are defined by the cross. You are defined by the blood of the Lamb slain for you. And He doesn't ask you to come and get your life right. He just calls you to repent and believe in faith. This man repented. He knew that he was guilty and deserving to die on the cross. And then he claimed that Jesus is Lord. Would you remember me in your kingdom? The cross is even for the worst of sinners. Fourth, the cross gives us access to God. The cross gives us access to God. Look at verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And when the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn, Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I can my spirit. And having said this, He breathed His last. 
It says it was about the sixth hour. That's noon. About noon in the middle of the day, everything went dark. And it was dark for three hours. Luke makes a point to note this because this is probably an astonishing scene. If at noon today, the sky went dark and was completely dark for three hours, you would know something was happening. And it was almost as if all creation was groaning and mourning the fact that God's anointed one was being killed. Not only that, the cosmic nature of it, all of creation recognizes Jesus in this moment, but also it says the curtain of the temple was torn in two. The curtain was this very strong curtain. It wasn't a flimsy curtain. It was this strong curtain. And it separated the holy of the rest of the temple. And in the holy of holies is where the presence of God dwelt. And no one could go in there except for the high priest. No one could go in. And the high priest to even go, he would have to make sacrifices. He would have to do ritual cleansings. He would have to wear the right things. And then, even then, before he went in, they would tie a rope around his ankle so that if he went in and approached God in an improper way, he would be struck dead and they'd be able to pull him out. The holiness of God was in this place. And it was guarded by this strong curtain. The priest was a mediator between sinful man and a holy God. And they could not get to God without that mediator. He would go through the veil. He would go through the curtain. Now we see the curtain of the temple is torn in two. Everyone on the outside, all the sinners gaze into the Holy of Holies. All the sinners, all the vilest criminals can now gaze into God's presence through who? Jesus Christ. That is what the cross has done. It has given us access to God. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 says, He entered once and for all into the holy places not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of His own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. He didn't go and say, yeah, I'm going to have to do this next week, and I'm going to have to do this next month and next year. No, Jesus says, I'm going to do this once and for all. And He says, I'm not going to take any goats or any calves to make a sacrifice, but I'm going to make the sacrifice with my own blood. Once and for all. And Jesus we have a God. We can go directly to Him. Jesus is our high priest and mediator. Jesus also called out with a loud voice, into your fa- Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Most scholars and people would agree that if you were dying on the cross in your last breaths, you could barely croak out a moan. But all four of the Gospels say that Jesus cried out with a loud voice, into your hands I commit my spirit. It makes me think of John chapter 10. John chapter 10 where Jesus tells them, I am the good shepherd. And look at what He says in John chapter 10 verse 18. Jesus talking about His life says, No one takes it from Me, but I lay it down of My own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up. Jesus, I believe, cried out in a loud voice, Father, into Your hands I commit my spirit. He says, it is finished. It is done. The wrath of God has been satisfied, and now, God, I'm laying my life down for these people. That is what Jesus has done for us. Brian chapel he is a pastor he talks about this story about his wife when she was growing up they went camping with her family and her and her sisters kind of wandered off from the campsite and they were going through the woods and looking at some stuff and they turned over a hornet's nest and all of these hornets started swarming around them and they started screaming and she said she didn't know what to do and then after just a moment she heard a rustling and then all of a sudden someone picked her up and it was her dad He had heard them screaming and he had ran to them and picked them up. And she said, then he started running back. He had me and my sister in his arms and he's running out of there. But finally he gets us back to the camp and he uses 
that story to show the picture of how God has come for us. God has been on a rescue mission and it wasn't easy and it hurt and it ended up killing His own Son. But God has been on a rescue mission for you through the cross. And now, through Jesus Christ, if we would believe in Him, we can have forgiveness of sins and we can have access to God. When times are difficult, when times are tough, when we don't know where to turn, we can go directly to God the Father through Jesus Christ. And so the cross gives us access to God. And finally, the cross shows us that Jesus is Lord of all. The cross shows us that Jesus is Lord of all. Look at verse 47. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God. And all the crowds, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. This centurion, he had saw the sky go dark. In the Gospel of Matthew, it says that there was an earthquake. The curtain is torn in two. He sees all of this happening and he says, surely this man is innocent. We've done something wrong here because this is not just another common criminal. In Matthew's account, it says, truly this is the Son of God. The centurion recognizes that something normal has not just taken place. Also, the people who leave, they are taken aback. They leave mourning. It doesn't say that this crowd who crucified Jesus. This is a different crowd. People, the spectacle would come out. All the crowds would come out and they would watch what was happening. And so likely these people had seen plenty of crucifixions before. But now they walk away and they are mourning and they are upset because they said something is different about this. And I think they recognized that Jesus is Lord. I think 50 days later, at the day of Pentecost, when Peter gets up to proclaim Jesus and what he's done, what happened? 3,000 people believed. And I can only imagine that many of them were there to see this. And that the cross had an impact on them. Because they said, this isn't normal, what has just happened. Because Jesus is Lord of all. The crowds here are contrasted with the crowds who are shouting, Crucify Him. Here is contrasted with the Roman seeing Jesus. One criminal rejected Jesus and one accepted Him. The question is, what is your response to the cross? All of us must ask that question. What is our response? Are we going to reject Jesus? Or are we going to bow down to Him as Lord? Are we going to spurn the cross and what He has done for us? Are we going to respond in gratitude to Him? Will you mock and ridicule Jesus and what He's done on the cross by making Him play second fiddle in your life? Are you going to insult Jesus by saying, you know what, God, I know what you want me to do, but I'm going to go do this instead? Or when we think about the cross, Will we come humbly to it and say, Lord, You have done all of this for me. My life is Yours. I... Will you be like the criminal? Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've done this wrong. But You are Lord. Would You save me? Would You pray with me? Lord, we come to You now. And we ask for Your help. Lord, I pray that You would focus our attention on the cross. On what You have done for us and You would help us to respond with gratitude and praise to our King forever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.